When we determine the symmetries of a polygon, for example, this four-pointed star, what are we really doing? We're really figuring out a set of operations which leave this polygon in place, but might change around some of its things. For example, if I reflect this star about its vertical axis, I'm going to change the location of two of its vertices. In this example, the two and the four end up trading places. And since vertices have to stay where vertices were in a symmetry of a polygon, what that really does is it realizes that symmetry as an element of the symmetric group, in this case, on four symbols. Here it would just be the element that flip-flops two with four, right? that transposition. What we'd like to do is take this understanding, not just of symmetries and how they're realized as elements in the symmetric group, but also the understanding that every symmetry is going to have a fixed set. In the case of this reflection, that vertical axis, when I apply this symmetry, is staying put. We call that an invariant of the symmetry. We want to take that understanding that we can have from simple geometry and extend it to our understanding of field extensions, whereby we're going to construct a group of automorphisms of an extended field over its base field. And by understanding that group, and by understanding the invariants of each of its elements, we should be able to get as much of an understanding of the structure of that field as we can, and thereby as much of an understanding of the roots of a polynomial as possible. So we looked at polygons, constructing symmetries, looking at the invariants of each of those symmetries, and then figuring out the algebraic structure behind the symmetry group by, for example, realizing each of those groups as a subgroup of Sn for every n gone. So let's take a step forward and think about what the story looks like for field automorphisms. So in other words, for an extension of a, an extended field over a base field. So in place of our polygons with n vertices, what we're going to have here are degree n extensions of fields. So we're primarily going to be concerned here with algebraic extensions, finite algebraic extensions of degree n. So there'll be a minimal polynomial of degree n, for example. And in place of the idea of symmetries of polygons, symmetries of polygons were all linear transformations, we actually want a slightly stronger notion when we're talking about fields. And that's the notion of a field automorphism. So we'll have to define what that means. But uh, generally speaking, an automorphism can be thought of as an isomorphism of the extended field to itself. Where we had invariants before in our geometric example, we're going to have invariants here as well, but we give them a different name. We call them the fixed fields of each of the automorphisms. And then finally, where we had symmetry groups for our polygons, we just rebrand them when we're talking about fields. Instead of calling them symmetry groups, we're going to call them automorphism groups. But just like with symmetry groups, they're going to be subgroups, or rather isomorphic to subgroups, of Sn for a degree n field extension. Automorphism groups often also go by a different name. They go by the name of the Galois group of a field extension. Named for Everest Galois, who famously uh, laid the foundation for all of these ideas in the 19th century. And again, one of the greatest observations that we're going to have is that every automorphism group for a degree n field extension must be isomorphic to a subgroup of the symmetric group on n symbols. Let's lay the groundwork with some definitions. So we understand by now, because we've been talking about it for a while, what exactly a field extension is. If f is our base field, e is our extended field, then we have some monomorphism, some one-to-one -one homomorphism of fields from f into e that realizes the image of f as a subfield inside of e. OK, so what's an automorphism? First and foremost, an automorphism is a function from a field to itself. So phi from e to e in this example, where e is our extended field. But it also has properties. And there are four of them. The first two have to do with the arithmetic structure of our field. And they say that phi, my automorphism, has to preserve addition. So phi of a plus b is phi of a plus phi of b. And it has to preserve multiplication. So phi of a times b is phi of a times phi of b. You can already tell that there probably aren't a lot of functions that satisfy this criteria. But taken together, those two are what make phi a homomorphism of fields. But we have some more criteria, because we don't just want any homomorphism. We next want phi to be invertible. After all, we'd like for these automorphisms to form a group, and in a group we need inverses for every element. So phi has to be one to one, and it has to be on to. That will make phi an isomorphism of fields. But there's one more criterion that we need. 
we're going to be interested in those automorphisms of E, the extended field, such that on the base field F, the automorphism is trivial. In other words, every element of the base field itself, phi doesn't do anything to. It leaves it in place. So this is why we call it phi an automorphism of E over F. When we say over F, we mean that F is not changing at all under this automorphism. So these are going to take the place of the symmetries that we were thinking about in the context of polygons. Taking the place of the invariants are the fixed fields. And the definition of a fixed field is that if phi is an automorphism of E over F, so the extended field over the base field, then the fixed field of phi is denoted by F with a superscript phi. And the idea is this is going to consist of everything that doesn't move under phi. It's all the elements of E such that phi of E is equal to E. All the elements on which phi acts like the identity. Now because phi is an automorphism of E over F, we know that every element of F is going to belong to any of these fixed fields because every phi is going to not move anything in F. And by construction, all of these are elements of E. So the fixed fields are always going to be intermediate between the base and the extended. So this is kind of interesting. These fixed fields are going to help us to understand the structure of the extended field by understanding what subfields are intermediate between the base and the extension. In other words, they're going to tell us how to kind of go step by step from the base all the way up to the extended field. Then finally, the automorphism group of E over F, or if you like, the Galois group of E over F, is just defined to be the set of all automorphisms of E over F. Now that's just a set. I'm claiming that this is a group, and it is a group under the operation of the composition of two automorphisms. And you can check that uh, if I compose two automorphisms with one another, that the result is still an automorphism. So as our first example, let's look at the story of the complex field as an extension of the field of real numbers. Now, we can write every element of the complex field as uh, a linear combination of 1 and i, right? It's the same thing as r adjoined with i. And so the minimal polynomial of this finite extension is t squared plus 1. So it's degree 2. And because we can write every element of r adjoined i as x plus y i, with x and y being real numbers, when we go to talk about automorphisms, all of our automorphisms are going to be functions that send x plus y i, which we can think of as just having the coordinates x comma y in the basis 1 and i. It's going to send it to something. And what it sends it to is going to be a multiple of xy by a 2 by 2 matrix. Why? Because every field homomorphism is first and foremost a linear transformation of that field. And so by the tenets of linear algebra, we have a linear transformation of a finite dimensional vector space to itself. That dimension here is 2. And therefore, we have a 2 by 2 matrix that we can represent this transformation by in a basis of our choosing, which here we'll use 1 and i as our basis. So that limits our search quite a bit. It tells us that we should look, if we want to define this automorphism, for a 2 by 2 matrix that satisfies all of the properties that we've listed at the top of the page here. Let's think about what the first column of this matrix ought to be. Now the first column of a matrix, you can check from linear algebra, is exactly what you get when you multiply that matrix by the vector 1, 0. But the vector 1, 0 in a basis of 1 and i really represents 1 plus 0, i in this example. But 1 plus 0, i is just 1. And when I take phi of 1, I must get 1 because 1 belongs to the base field and phi has to be an automorphism over the base field. In other words, because 1 is a real number and phi is an automorphism of c over r, that must mean that every real number, in particular 1, cannot get changed by phi. So phi of 1 is equal to 1. And written in the basis of 1 and i, that's 1 plus 0 i, again. And that makes the first column of this matrix equal to 1, 0. How about the second column? To find the second column, we just need to apply this linear transformation to 0 plus 1 i and figure out what happens. So the question is, what is phi of i? Well, it's not quite as simple as phi of 1 was, but it can be made to be simple if I just square both sides. Now, because phi respects multiplication, phi of i, the quantity squared, is the same as phi applied to i squared. But i squared is negative 1, and negative 1 is a real number. Therefore, because phi is an automorphism over r, phi of negative 1 is equal to negative 1. So phi of i squared is equal to negative 1. That tells us what choices we have for phi of i. Phi of i is a number whose square is equal to the real number negative 1. And so phi, if we take the square root here, 
phi of i could be i, but it could also be minus i. So what this does is it gives us two different possibilities for what the second column of this matrix can be that are going to result in us having two different automorphisms for the complex numbers over the real numbers. Let's look at the fixed fields. But first, let's think about what is the analogy of this to our symmetries of polygons. Here I'm going to kind of think of the polygon as being just this little vertical line segment that has i at the top minus i at the bottom, and then the dot in the middle kind of represents the real numbers. Then I have one matrix, which is just the identity matrix from up here, where I choose the plus one in the lower right hand corner. That's the identity transformation. It sends x plus yi to x plus yi. If I do that, my i's stay in place and my r stays in place. Meanwhile, if I choose the minus one, then what's going to happen is that the i and the minus i are going to trade places. So it's as though I'm reflecting this line segment through its center. Again, r is staying in place, but the i's are trading places. So x plus yi goes to x minus yi. That's the usual complex conjugation. What are the fixed fields? Well, because the identity is the identity, it fixes everything. Every element stays exactly where it is when we apply the identity transformation to it. But the reflection, on the other hand, it moves all of our i's to minus i's and vice versa. Therefore, the only thing that's going to remain unchanged by the reflection, i.e. the complex conjugate, are going to be the numbers that are just real. So the fixed field of the reflection here, the conjugation, is just the reals. So what this has done is it's kind of set up for us a couple of different possibilities for intermediate fields. If we think about the fixed field of the identity, that fixed field is all of the complex numbers because the identity fixes everything. And then if we think of the fixed field of t, our complex conjugation, that fixed field is the reals. And so each of those can kind of be thought of as an intermediate field between r and c, except in this example at least, it looks like none of those are an interesting intermediate field because each one of them is equal either to the base or to the extended field. Finally, what is the automorphism group or the Galois group of this field extension? Well, it's going to be the set of all automorphisms of C over R, and we know that it has to be a subgroup of S2, the symmetric group on two symbols. And we only found two things, E and T. Let's check that T squared is actually equal to the identity. So what do we get when we apply T twice, T of T of X plus YI? Well, evaluating the inside, X plus YI under our complex conjugation becomes X minus YI. And then if I conjugate it one more time, it becomes X plus YI again. And that's the same thing as e applied to x plus yi. So t composed with t is equal to the identity. That makes t an element of order 2 in the automorphism group. So therefore, what I have for this Galois group is something that is isomorphic to z mod 2. So that's the first example of discovering a Galois group for a field extension just by insisting that we have automorphisms of c over r in this example and kind of linking it to what we were looking at with symmetries of polygons before. In the next video, we're going to take a look at some more intricate examples where instead of just having kind of these two roots to play with, that we might have some more. And then the story gets considerably more interesting.